And what was your first kind of connection with carnivorous plants? Like, how did you, how did you get interested in them and create this a magical realm that we're sitting in today with this incredible diversity? Yeah, like, um, I think I always wanted to take care of weird things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so I got a, a fly trap at a grocery store like most people do. And when I was a kid, and when you get those plants, typically they're grown in a lab. And they've never like a fly trap actually needs to go through a winter dormancy it needs a rest period to maintain like physiological vigor and so when you get those plants at the grocery store at home depot they've never seen the real light of day they've never taken a breath of the fresh air and they've never seen a winter dormancy so they're kind of showing up ready to fail right and so I, I got one of those and I failed. I killed, uh, it was the first in thousands of plants that I've killed. <laughs> and, um, but it really started an interest for me. And then, so I killed that thing and then years, fast forward like a couple decades, and a couple of my plant friends took me to the Jordan River bogs, just up from Victoria. And I saw my first bogs, my first carnivorous plants in habitat in Canada. A drive away like an hour away from my house in Victoria full of wild flowers and frogs and birds and it was magic it was totally magic seeing them in the wild in context and I was just totally hooked and so I ended up getting my degree uh, my undergraduate degree and doing an honors thesis I, I had an advisor who had done 30 years of field work in Borneo and he has incredible stories of all of the stuff he's seen deep ecology of carnivorous plants. So it just totally snowballed from there. Amazing. Insects are the most common meal, but I understand there's a whole range of things that these guys can digest. Yeah, um, Saracenia, almost like we have um, Nepenthes flava here, that's like a wasp specialist, and Saracenia leucophila, which is the white top pitcher, and they do actually the best, the biggest, fattest, whitest pitchers in the fall and they are moth specialists so they stand out kind of like ghosts in the night and suck up wasps on these uh, migration routes like on nepenthes macrophylla the teeth are quite accentuated and collectors love them but then there's again that reason like well why does the plant do that though mm -hmm. and it's a really cool reason i think is that it's an on off switch having to do with high and low humidity so when the humidity is low, uh, insects can come up onto this pitcher, can feed around the opening of the peristome safely. It's not slippery at all. There's nectaries there. There's reward. There's a reward on the lid. So it'll tell all its friends. There's a great buffet down at Nepenthes <laughs> Azumier today. Yeah. And it tells all its friends that the fr it shows up to the party and the humidity's picked up. And when the humidity picks up, those flanges, those teeth turn into just a death trap. <laughs> so it becomes super, super slippery in high humidity. And so carnivorous plants do this. They make an environment safe to get the word out and then things change and it becomes a death trap. And so, yeah, that's the reason why so many Nepenth uh, Nepenthes have these um, flared or teethed peristomes. So this is the only Saracenia that grows in Canada, um, and that's called Saracenia purpurea. And notice that it's got a lot different strategy than the rest of our Saracenia. You see how with our other Saracenia, they have lids covering their openings. So that's saying that doesn't, these plants don't want to let rain in. Mm. They're producing their own digestive enzymes in the pitchers to deal with their prey and uh, rain is gonna be problematic, it's gonna dilute it. Saracenia purpurea has a totally different strategy. It lets the rain in. And instead of producing um, digestive glands, it has like little mutualists living in there, protists and whatnot, that break down the insect prey and bring it into the plant tissue. So it's a, a different strategy, but, but Saracenia purpurea recently was found to eat baby salamanders. Wow. <laughs> so Darwin actually originally called them insectivorous plants, but that name had to be changed when we found out they eat more than insectivores. 
but this is an, a, a dynamic of evolution and things are always shifting and changing. And there's actually some Nepenthes that, uh, and those are the tropical pitcher plants we have some examples over there from, that are evolving out of carnivory and into being toilets for tree shrews. Sorry, say that again? Toilets for? Tree shrews. And so how does that work? So. <laughs> Um, there are these tree shrews that live up in the high mountains in Borneo. Uh, I think Tupaya montana is the, the genus and species. And we don't fully uh, understand all of the layers of this relationship, but there's three or four Nepenthe species, including one over there, that the pitchers have these lids that are splayed back and they have all these hairs and they produce an exudate, some of them produce an exudate, which is like a delicious food for these tree shrews. And the colors on the lid of the Nepenthes are tuned to be like a visual entertainment for the rods and cones in the eyes of the tree shrews. And so the tree shrews splay over on these pitchers and start licking the exudate and watching this sort of visual painting on the lid. And as it's doing this, it goes to the bathroom and the pitchers are hour sh hourglass shaped a lot of times and they're shaped like toilets yeah, right. and the nutrients from the pee and poo of the of the the tree shrew again is a better fertilizer in that environment uh, more readily available than insect prey so those species are thought to be evolving out of typically catching carn like insects or animals and they're now becoming toilets for small mammals wow. <laughs> And Amazing. visually, they're some of the most bizarre and interesting of yeah. all of their carnivorous plants. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. When we produce our seed and our seeds are ready, we'll sow them. And then like this tray right here is just, these are baby Saracenia. So those are tiny little pitcher oh, wow, plants. Man. These are tiny little sundews. And each of these are genetically unique. And so these are are genetically unique plants that we've done special crosses with, with visions of either producing species or different hybrids. And so those will be plants that um, no one else has. They've never been created before. And so every year we have new stuff that we're making and kind of experimenting with. You know, the Saracenia purpurea, the Canadian native one, sometimes has a hard time handling the heat. So we're trying to breed heat tolerant Saracenia purpurea. So you know, Canadians can grow the, the, the one Saracenia pitcher plant that's native to Canada and not have to worry about dying midsummer or something like that. So, you know, these are mother plants. Some of them are famous clones and stuff. And I think they look pretty good, but um, people love pigments and people love dark reds and stuff like that. And we still see a lot of green and yellow here. And this was a cross we did a couple years ago right here. Look at all the reds. Oh yeah. So we're, you know, it's it's cool when you get a result um, where it's it's typically quite difficult to get um, deeply red pigmented plants from top to bottom. There's no central nervous system here. So Morella, my daughter, actually came up with this idea. I'm not sure this is even going to work, but we can try. Um, what happens? When you do this, I've just taken this, right? Will it still close? Oh yeah. Ah. So it doesn't need a head. <laughs> Not that it has one. Right. Wow. So it's a, a pretty interesting thing from yeah. someone, from an animal perspective, that we need a brain to control all of these mechanisms, this sophisticated mechanism. but. Even when you snap it off the plant, it's still in the cellular structure to do that same thing, to still be able to close and still not be able to fully close. So it's, it's about cellular cascades within the cell that, that causes that sophistication. Yeah, there's a theory that the, because flytraps are the only one to do this, why would you spend so much time capturing and holding and protecting your single piece of prey? And the theory is that um, potentially flytraps uh, evolved in an aquatic environment.
where if you don't hold and totally sequester your prey away, it will get washed away from you. Whereas everything else, you know, Saracenias can fill up with a thousand wasps in a big picture, you know, and they're not doing any kind of movement. They're not, right. they're not like, you know, suffocating it um, to to retain it. So it's an interesting question why fly traps do the thing that they do because it's a lot of energy for a single capture. Mm -hmm. you know, we've yeah. been shipping plants since 2015, 2016. And it's our specialty. It's like our, it's become, even on days when I don't want it to be, <laughs> it is my jam, like packing. And we'll do a lot of potted plants that become super popular. It's just taking a, a full, you know, a fully potted sundew, trimming it up, um, making it look gorgeous for you, wrapping it all so the soil won't come out, putting a, a dome over it and securely shipping it to Newfoundland. Amazing. And and the way this works is amazingly we ve have very little problems with it like almost in maybe a handful a year that's fantastic so wow. yeah yeah wow. what a nice service to be able to provide 